Manon started her professional career as a neonatal nurse. And she started caring for the most fragile and critically ill babies in the neonatal intensive care unit at Montreal Children's Hospital. And that's where she developed her interest in the care of preterm infants and pain management. She then went on to complete a master's of science in nursing, uh, worked as a pediatric clinical nurse specializing in acute pain, and then did her doctoral degree in nursing at McGill University. The last four years at UBC, she has been leading some cutting edge, both animal uh, research, looking at the adverse effects of early life stress <clears throat> on brain development, and also looking at um, the very ill and fragile, critically ill babies at Children's Hospital. So please welcome Manoa. And Manoa has said she would be happy to answer questions throughout her, her session. So if you have questions in the chat, um, I will interrupt her and ask the question for you, or you can ask them at the end. So Manoa, welcome, and please go ahead. Thank you uh, to the DFP lead and to Naz for the invitation to talk today. This presentation will be quite different from what I uh, usually give and probably different from past uh, presentations at this seminar, but so let's begin. So today I will share my experiences using various technologies um, in my research over the, the last 20 years, mostly from my uh, training um, and from the really from the early years when I was a new nurse uh, to now at UBC as an assistant professor at the, the School of Nursing. And I will focus on the methodological aspects of the research and how technology supported the data collection to answer some clinically uh, driven questions. So I will spend much less time on the actual research findings uh, and which is what I normally do. And so here you can see a timeline with, on which I populated the different technology that I used uh, during my studies mostly. And from the early 20,000 uh, when I was a nurse to, to now. And we will touch upon every kind of like big bullet points. And so, but before I, uh, uh, start talking about technology and research, I wanted to provide a bit of context. So 20 years ago in the NICU, so NICU, NICU, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at the Montreal Children's Hospital as a new nurse is where it all began for me. And since then, uh, my strong interest in the care of preterm infants and children and in pain management, and also on the impact of early stress on brain development has just grown. And my passion uh, has never ceased uh, because there's always new discoveries. Um, but one of the reasons why this work is so important with preterm children um, and it's so critical is that um, the, during this early development time, the brain undergoes uh, dramatic uh, structural and functional changes that normally occur when the baby is in the protective intrauterine uh, environment of its mother's womb. And so when this uh, is interrupted, uh, it can dramatically impact um, uh, the, the, the brain development of these babies if they're born too early or preterm or prematurely which is at less than 37 weeks gestation, whereas a normal gestation is 40 weeks. And so I wanted to understand how being born too early impacts brain development, but I also wanted to find ways to better help these little babies, these fragile babies, to in the best possible way. And uh, this image really speaks for itself, but when preterm babies are born, especially when they're extremely or very preterm, so less than 32 weeks gestation, um, their brains are very immature and they're very smooth looking like the brain that you can see on the slide at 24 weeks. 
And by the time that they're discharged from their stay in the NICU, um, at term equivalent age, their brain looks more like the one uh, that we see uh, at 40 weeks, which is what we normally are more accustomed to seeing. And so importantly, throughout this phase of immaturity, the nervous system uh, shows a very heightened activation to any type of sensation. So it can be pain, but it can also be touched. And it also has, a, as I said, a, very difficulty discriminating. And so any type of, of stimulation will kind of rewire the brain and it will have long-term effects. And so for those that are not familiar to the NICU clinical environment, uh, where most of these uh, preterm babies spend weeks to months, um, uh, this is, I will use a clinical example of a baby that is cared for in the, in the NICU, as we see um, on, on the top left, I, I believe it's the left uh, screen, um, that to provide context. Um, um, so, um, and this case was borrowed by, from a colleague at, um, at the IWK, Dr. Marsha Cambolio, and it reflects the data that you can see here. It reflects a participant uh, from a, a study done in her lab. And the participant is pictured uh, on the left side. And this little fragile baby was born four months too early, so at 25 weeks gestation, uh, weighing about 700 grams. So that's very, very small. And he spent um, 118 days in the NICU, so about 17 weeks. And during this time, I circled the things that were are really um, uh, dramatic. So he endured over a thousand painful procedures. So that comes about to nine to 10 procedures per day, which is what is reported also in the, in the literature. And he was exposed also to some um, 24% sucrose over 800 times. And this is because we give, the, um, this is standard care in many, many NICUs all over the world, but they give a little bit of sugar water before a painful procedures because it calms down the baby. And uh, one of the most common painful procedures, you can see a picture above, is, is when they poke the heel for to get some blood. And importantly, um, during this time, in the NICU, um, he, uh, this little baby was separated from his family, not on purpose, but because they were not there or so alone in his, in his incubator over 2000 hours. And so that comes about to 80% of, of the time that he spent alone. And so from this experience, being a new nurse and exposed, it was very difficult to assess pain in these babies because some are so sick that they don't really cry. They are not showing any signs. They're not moving much or they're so young that they are not or they're plugged to so many things that so it was very difficult. And so, but we knew that they were probably in pain because of what we were doing to them or what they, they were suffering. Uh, so for me, what I wanted was like, because we rely on behaviors to assess pain in these babies, but it, it was, is, was it possible to get like a bedside measure of what was going on in their brain, like a signal? And so um, um, I, um, came upon two papers uh, that uh, were using near infrared spectroscopy as a proxy measure to measure pain. So the, the, and it, the usefulness of this was that you could bring it to the bedside instead of like bringing the baby to an MRI scan or something. And so, the, and this brought me to work at, in, at Boston Children's with a great group of, of people that were using mirrors uh, at Harvard Medical School and also at MIT. So they, they were using NIRS to, to just measure brain, um, uh, to monitor brain blood flow and, and pre to prevent uh, bleeds in their brain, which is very common in preterm babies. But um, um, so I went there to train and, and from there, I also ended up doing my research, um, my PhD research that was from McGill University. 
So as a training purpose, uh, what I did is that they had some recordings of babies during the first uh, 72 hours of life uh, of NIRS. And I was specifically interested in pain. And so I looked at some babies that had painful procedures, so a heel lance. And I looked if we could see a signal uh, with using the, the NIRS. And what I found was uh, not a clear cut answer. So I was a bit disappointed, but it didn't make me, it didn't prevent me from moving forward to do my own PhD work. But this is the kind of data that I, um, I came across. So on the, on the left side, patient three, you can see uh, at, at time zero, which is when the, the painful procedure happened, we can see a clear signal, an increase in total hemoglobin, uh, and also a, an increase in the difference in a, a total hem in a hemoglobin uh, oxygenation. So that's like a, a kind of like an indicator of brain blood flow and brain uh, blood flow volume. And so this is what we were expecting. But then on the on the right side, patient two, flatline, nothing. So this. You know, and these babies are the same age. Uh, so this was a bit, oh my God, what do we do with this? Because really, I don't know what's going on. What does this mean? But still, I moved forward and I, I did, I conducted my own research uh, in a bit older babies um, after a cardiac um, uh, operation. They had a chest drain, that, which is normal because when you open the, the chest, uh, you need to, you play around, you fix the heart, and then you close it, and then there's fluid that needs to be drained, and so they have they have these chest drains that need to be removed, and it's an acute painful procedure that, that can be planned, and so I could come in, set up my equipment, and then do my measurements. And for this study, um, we put the, the um, it was just two um, single um, uh, channels of, of near-infrared spectroscopy that we put uh, on each um, side of the head to measure really the, the, the input that was at the somatosensory area. So right on the, on the, the top of the head. And, and so we used a Nero 300 machine and that was back in like 2008. So there's much better technology now, but this is the equipment that I used. And, and these are two pictures of babies. And it was not a wireless uh, setup. So now we have really cool um, NIRS uh, probes that I will talk about a bit later. But um, so this is what I had. And so what we found, so uh, again, I was a bit disappointed and disillusioned about NIRS readiness to be used at the bedside because you know these babies move the the probes move and it's there they have their hair so i was just like okay maybe this is not the answer but still um I, what i found was that it, it could be like um a, um a useful measure um especially when these babies are very sick and so there is a potential uh, in, um um risk of undetecting pain, especially when babies are under sedation so that they cannot, like they're, they're too, um, or too sick, they can not show, we could use NIRS to, to measure like a signal in, in their head. Um, um, so, but um, when I finished my PhD, uh, I said, no more NIRS, uh, uh, let's move on to something else. And I had the opportunity to come to UBC in 2012 to do a postdoc with Professor Ruth Bruno, a world leader in the field of early pain and brain development in infants born very preterm. And I had the, this, the opportunity also to contribute to some of this critical uh, evidence. And so, um, and I, I, so I, I joined uh, the, the, the Bruno lab um, um, then, and we used near, um, we used MRI to investigate the impact of pain and treatment on brain development. And so my work with Ruth focused on the long-term effects of neonatal pain exposure in a cohort of very preterm children that were born less than 32 weeks, and they were scanned. At seven, we, at seven years, 
And generally speaking, we showed that above and beyond the other kinds of um, clinical risk factors that might affect brain development, repeated procedural pain during the NICU care is associated with adverse effects on infants and child development. And it also shows that it, brain, it, it alters brain development and function uh, and also outcome. But for this particular work, uh, we, um, we worked with a group of biomedical engineers at SFU uh, led by Dr. Faisal uh, Beg, and they provided us with measures of cortical thickness in multiple subregions of the brain. So they were able to, with the scans that we sent them, uh, to subdivide the brain in different subregions and then provide um, cortical thickness measures. And so, and then when we got the, the, these data, we were able to look at the different uh, clinical uh, risk factors and see if it impacted uh, uh, these measures of uh, cortical thickness. And we demonstrated that greater pain exposure after controlling again for the uh, clinical risk factors that are related to prematurity, um, that um, um, pain exposure was associated with thinner cortex in multiple brain regions. And also importantly, um, the, the, among the neonatal clinical factors that we were looking at, the um, pain exposure was the most robust predictor of, of cortical thickness. And some of the arrows here shows the brain regions where we saw the, the most dramatic uh, link between early pain and, and cortical thickness. Another project that I co-led with uh, these same, using these same MRI scans involved examining subregional brain volumes, not cortical thickness, but brain volumes in relation to early pain. And so for this project, we worked with Dr. Malar Chakravarti's group at Sick Kids Children. Um, and um, before he went on to McGill, now he's at McGill. Um, uh, so his group also uh, did some um, similar work of, at segmented the brain scans uh, into subregions, and then they could provide measures of um, volumes uh, within these subregions. And they uh, also helped us further our investigations um, um, and using uh, uh, vertex-wise shape analysis across the subcortical surface area of uh, the hippocampus, the amygdala, the thalamus, and also the striatum. And so the difference between the vertex-wise uh, analysis and just, um, just um, uh, giving some volume measures is because many of these subregions are not very like just a, a round ball that you can just do a, a volume in it. They're all like the brain has many uh, crevices and and so it's very you can't just do a, 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 like a, a typical volume uh, measure this is from from what i gathered again you know this is why we work with really great people that know what they're doing but um and so this surface-based method allows to independently analyze the volume and also the positioning by looking at the volume and the surface at the same time and so this method estimates the overall volume of each structure, as well as the local surface area at a total of about 20,000 points or vertices and, and making it possible to resolve some focal alterations in subcortical shapes. And so, um, and so this, is, this is what they provided. And so with this, when they, gave us back the data of the volumes, we were able again to, through statistical analysis, uh, look at the effect of um, um, neonatal pain and also genetic variations. Uh, and, and, look, and so we found again that there was a, a strong relationship between uh, lower volumes and higher pain. And so, but, as I was mentioned, as I, as you can see in in um, in you when we conduct um, studies with humans, 
most of them can only be associated through association. So what we found is that, you know, uh, early pain is associated with later uh, brain volume uh, alterations and also cortical thickness. But we cannot say that early pain causes uh, a brain, uh, 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 smaller brain, uh, we cannot say that. Uh, so during the last portion of my postdoctoral uh, study, uh, I had the opportunity to do some, um, some animal work. And uh, because with, with that, we have the opportunity to really look at the brain and really look at relation, causal relationships. And why we do this type of study with using mice or rats is because baby mice or rats they make an excellent preclinical model to study conditions in the human uh, preterm neonate because they're born neurologically immature. So the first week of life corresponds to about a human equivalent of 24 to 32 weeks gestation, according to several brain structures. So when I say that they're born immature, they're not born preterm. As you can see here, the image in the middle, this is what they look like. So really they're their uh, eyes are fused, they cannot see, they're like a little, uh, they're like fetuses, uh, but this is when they're supposed to be born. This is just the way. So they're really reliant on their mothers. Um, and, and so by using these animal models of early adversity to simulate what uh, multiple aspects of what preterm newborn um, are like and experience in the, in the NICU during the first week of life, well, we can then use this information to inform um, a human longitudinal research. And also what is great is that within like three months, you get an adult mice. And so um, compared to really uh, uh, studying a, a human for, for a very long term, and it, it's always difficult because you get lots of, of dropping and uh, people dropping out of, of your research. And so I will just go briefly um, talk about the, 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 the main study that I was involved in, that I co-led. Um, and so um, here we uh, were aiming to um, examine the effects of repeated neonatal sucrose treatment. So as I mentioned, this is what is given for babies um, for procedural pain. Um, and before an intervention, and on, on, we looked at the long-term uh, behavior and brain development in, in mice. And so what we did is that during the first six days of life from, from day one to day six, mice were exposed, little pups were exposed to either a prick on the paw, a touch with the Q-tip or nothing. And they were given before that water or sucrose. And then they, were, um, they stayed with their mother, uh, until they were um, nearly adult, so about 21 days. And then we, then uh, at when they were about 60 to 85 days, we did some behavior testing. And then at the end, we collected brains in the skull, as you can see here. And then we sent those skulls to our friends in the mice lab at uh, U of T. Um, led by Dr. Lurch, who is, has now since left. But when he was there, um, they were able to provide us with, um, th this is amazing. Uh, and so um, they, they were able to, with this seven Tesla MRI, um, they were able to scan um, the, these, these brains uh, and provide us uh, volumes in 159 independent regions. And so that's crazy. Uh, these, these, these brains were scanned for, for, for 14, eight, uh, so, sorry, for 14 hours. And so of course, this is why the mice had to be um, um, terminated because of course you cannot scan a mouse uh, for, uh, for 14 hours. And also, we, they were they would stack them up, and so they would, um, you know, put um, I, I believe about fifteen um, skulls, and they they could scan them for, for fourteen hours, and then whoop, 
they they provided us with a hundred uh, with brain volumes in 159 brain regions and this is a picture that you can see here about the 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 main results that that we we got and so what what this provided us with is that we were able to show that that the mice that were exposed to sucrose compared to water during the first week of life, irrespective of if they had pain or not, they had significantly smaller volumes in many very important white matter structures like the corpus callosum, which is what connects the right side to the left side of the brain, the, the cerebellum, the hippocampus. Hippocampus is very important for memory formation. And so, 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 so these are some of the, the images that, that we saw. And so from these scans, they, were, they gave us a, a really nice um, um, video that compiled all the, the scans to do a 3D version of, of the brain to summarize the findings. And so I will start that here um, and uh, and so this is a coronal fly-through movie uh, that shows voxel-wise differences of the treatment, so water versus sucrose, at a 5 to 15% uh, uh, false discovery rate uh, on the cerebral volume um, through every slice of the brain from the back to the front. And so here, the regions that were quite like red, uh, orange, these were the ones that were the most significantly affected by, by sucrose. But isn't that cool? I just like, I love to see that movie. Um, and so this is great uh, stuff. And I'm, I'm so happy to be working with all these amazing people. It was, it was um, a great postdoc <laughs> because of that. And so we also did some behavior testing, as I mentioned, before the mice were sacrificed. And so here um, we used uh, some uh, image tracking system called EtoVision, which is like a camera that is on uh, above whatever we're doing. And so the behavior testing were to measure like anxiety, fear, um, memory. And so with this technology, um, it provides us a uh, um, measure and tracks the, the mouse. And then it tells us like we can ask many questions, how much time the, the mouse spent in the, the shaded area versus the open area. Or when we were doing memory, we were training the, the mouse to swim in a pool to, to locate a platform. So when we were training, the camera was on and it could tell us how much time as the, the mouse spent in each quadrant, how long it took the mouse to, to find the platform. And then when we tested the mice, uh, we removed the platform and then it would tell us also, also these, these questions. And so it could answer all these questions, which is great because otherwise doing it manually is, is, uh, is less precise. And so, so this is a great technology also. And now that was, in 2014, now the technology is even better. But also during my postdoc, uh, early on, uh, because I was considered the person that knew about NIRS uh, from my PhD, Lisa contacted me to help her um, with her trial with the Calmer. And so I won't go into details about Calmer because most of you know, about Calmer, Lisa has uh, spoken uh, about uh, the, the wonders of, of Calmer uh, effect on, on um, during pain um, when she conducted her um, first uh, trial. But these are just the, 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 the uh, summary of the findings, uh, but my work was really involved in, in NIRS. So I said that, you know, I was done with NIRS, but here I am and I'm still using NIRS so I guess uh, Nears and I are, are, are here to stay together. <laughs> uh, but I must say that the technology has much, uh, it's improved and just having wireless and these little probes uh, that uh, are, are um, it, it makes a huge difference that we can use actually with, with these small babies. 
And so with, with, the, nears, uh, with the, the nears and the calmer, my involvement was looking at the, the brain activity, the brain oxygenation during a painful procedure, comparing babies that were on calmer uh, versus a standard care. And so, and we, we showed that it was, calmer was as effective at, at stabilizing brain's hemodynamic response during a blood collection compared to standard care. And so the next step with the, the calmer three um, a prototype is to look at the extended exposure uh, of calmer on preterm infants and looking specifically at brain um, maturation. Which leads me to now, uh, no, excuse me, Oop, okay. So I will need to go faster, but basically, um, so I, I guess I will not have time uh, to um, talk about the current, unfortunately, because I spent too much time on the past, but I just wanted to touch upon the, the work that I did in between my postdoc and coming back to UBC as a research scientist um, at um, Columbia University, where we used EEG and also ultrasonic vocalizations to investigate the impact of maternal separation. And so here uh, we had, it was done in rats, and we used some wireless technology to measure EEG activity in these, um, these little rat babies. And so we had, the, the, the study was looking at the effect of uh, separating the, the pups from their mother for three hours per day uh, for the first 10 days of life compared to the ones that were not. And so at, at 10 days, um, some pups were implanted with these, um, these um, wireless single channel biopotential telemetric devices uh, from uh, Physiotel. Um, and so these, so these pups are about 20 grams, 25 grams. And each little device is about 1.6 gram. But as you can see on the image, so we had to do an incision on the head to put the electrodes. And then the, the actual um, device, which is basically a battery, was tucked in uh, beneath the skin. And so they looked like they had a little backpack, but you know, they, they normally uh, recovered and uh, it just that, it impacted a bit the, the way that they walk, but but basically we were able to capture some um, some EEG activity while they were behaving normally in their cage with their mother, uh, nursing, doing whatever they they were doing normally, uh, which is great because then they're not wired. It doesn't uh, impact their their behavior. And so this is the kind of data that we we uh, were able to capture and. Um, uh, this is just an example of a 13-day-old female uh, pup uh, when she was attached to her mother's nipple and sleeping. So most of the pups, they spend all their time just attached to the nipple. Compared to humans, there's not a constant flow of milk. They're just attached. And then there's a milk ejection, which is like really a robust. You can see it. They become very stiff and they they wiggle around and then they get reattached and then they wait for the next ejection. But we were able to capture this, this kind of reaction in their brain. And so um, on, on the slide on the left, uh, this is a spectrogram displaying the spectral power um, and it's coded as a color. And so against time uh, on the X axis and, um, and the frequency of the signal is on the right side. And so the more yellow, the stronger the, um, the, um, the, the power density uh, is compared to blue. And so you can see that there's a clear um, uh, demarcation when there's a, a milk ejection. And, and because the pups, you know, they're just normally interacting, they're under their, da their mom, and there's a lot of, of um, 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 high frequency noise. And so um, you need to clean the data, of course. And on the right side is um, how, we, how we process the, the, um, the, um, the processing steps. And so you can see that uh, you come from a 200 second um, 
chunk and then you mark it down into one second epochs and then uh, from there um, uh, you you even make it smaller to a one second epoch and then you're able to uh, through um, fast Fourier transformation to get the um, the power spectral density of the data and to so for the USV acquisition, so USV meaning ultrasonic vocalization. So pups, uh, um, well, even mice in general, uh, not mice, but uh, well, mice, yes, and rats, they um, evoke some, some um, ultrasonic vocalizations that we cannot hear, but that if you can use, if you use a, a specific uh, microphones, um, to to um, capture this this um, wa these wavelengths, then you can you can um, analyze the the different um, um, kind of communication, as uh, if you can say. And so, um, and USVs can be reliably uh, elicited when the pups are put alone, especially. And so we use this paradigm where we would. Um, 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 remove the dam from from um, from their pups uh, for 30 minutes and then individually we would pick up a, a pup isolated for three minutes measure some usvs and then reun you reunite the pup with the with the mom as you can see in the middle um, for three minutes and then you remove again the mom and then they cry even more. So, you know, at first they cry and they can cry. When I say cry, it's not like we say cry, but who knows if they're crying, but they elicit these, these ultrasonic vocalizations. And they can, it can be up to 500 in three minutes. Really, it's a lot. And, and then normally they stop crying when, when their mom is there. And then they cry even more because it's like, ah, oh, my mom, where is she? And so, um, and the, 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 these calls range in frequency from about five to 120 kilohertz. And, um, but they concentrate around two frequency ranges, around 40 kilohertz, and also higher at around 66 kilohertz. And in this study, we, we were able to show that the pups that underwent maternal septic Operation, they cried at higher frequencies compared to the pups that were not. And so, um, and we used the, the microphone that we used was, was the um, Avisoft ultrasound sensitive microphone uh, from uh, Bioacoustics. And how we analyze the USV data? Well, um, we used the Raven Pro software that was developed at Cornell University to, to process the data. And also, but so the, 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 um, the program identifies these calls. So you can see on, on the slide, um, but then you need to do some um, quality control to make sure that the calls that it was, that was identified by the program are truly calls because they really vary in length. Some are very, very short, some are longer, as you can see, uh, and at different um, uh, frequency also. And then from, from this identification, um, we were able to um, then um, get some, some measures of the, the frequency, the length, the power, the peak power, the, all these types of, of measures, and we were able to compare the two groups. But moving forward, because I want to continue using this technology, um, I would look more into using a fairly recent uh, um, um, software that is called Deep Squeak. So maybe some of you are familiar with this. Um, so it, it, it is for detecting USV, um, but also analysis. And, um, and so they use machine learning and it's much, much better a technology uh, software. So that, that I, will, I will use uh, too moving forward. And if anybody is familiar with this, please email me. I would be very happy because this is something that now I will be using with mice. 
And so um, it, it might be a bit different. And so now as, as assistant professor, I think I still have time, Guy? Okay, great. <sighs> <laughs> um, because I guess we started a bit late also, I must say. We started, I saw uh, that we started five minutes late, so I have a bit more time. Um, so at, now as, as an assistant professor uh, since 2019, uh, I work again with amazing people like Lisa, Guy, and Naz, and, and many people maybe that are here, Pascal. So I'm um, Pascal Lavoie. And, and I'm, I'm up for, for collaborating even more. But currently I don't have any data to provide because I'm, we've just started. So I will be doing, we are in my lab, we are doing again, some animal work, pursuing the, the, um, the um, research that uh, I uh, started during my postdoc. And so we're using the same type of model of early pain and sucrose, but now we want to look at the trajectory of these effects and also really looking more specifically at the brain and looking also at inflammation markers. And so we will use different time points to collect brain tissue and, um, and blood, and then look at, at different um, um, inflammatory markers and then link them also to a brain um, looking at um, uh, different um, cell types, different neurons, and looking at how they're affected by this, the, these, uh, th these procedures and the treatment. And we will also do some more fancy um, uh, behavior testing. And also we will, again, do some brain scanning and send those, those brains back at the mice lab. And then this brings me to the involvement with Lisa and Guy um, with the, the, the calmer, uh, the, the, the new prototype for extended use, uh, where it, we're going to, uh, babies will be on calmer for three weeks and looking at uh, brain development. And so here on the slide, you see a full EEG setup, which is something that eventually I would like to do. Um, but for now, we are just starting a, a pilot um, and we will use the Neolite device that maybe um, Guy ha or Baz has presented already at this group, I'm not sure, but um, this is a dual EEG uh, NIRS device that is especially made for little, little tiny babies and it's wireless. So this is, will be great and I will, this will be my first time using this this device, but um, Lisa has been doing some preliminary um, uh, um, study in the NICU. And this is um, uh, um, some of the, uh, just a, um, an example of the data that has been collected. Um, and it, it, this comes from um, the, um, one of the, the developers of, of this, the new light. Um, the PhD student of, of Dr. Dumont. And, um, and so the, the, from, from what I gathered, I haven't even seen it in real life, but the, the, this NIRS EEG probe consists of, of one near source. So, um, and, and one detector, and then it has also three, uh, well, two uh, EEG um, uh, channels plus one reference. And the great thing about, about this, this um, device is that, well, of course, you know, it provides both, which is great because then we can study not only the, the um, oxygenation level in, in brain tissue and electrical um, um, activity, but combining these two to look at the neurovascular coupling, which is, which is great. And also it, it is wireless. And it, it also allows, from what I gather, to really detect very, very low um, frequencies um, in, in the EEG signal, which are very important, uh, especially when during um, uh, brain monitoring during sleep, because there's very, very slow waves uh, during sleep in, in preterm uh, babies, well, in general. 
And so using this technology, we will be able to really look at these, these uh, slow waves um, signals. And so from here, I, I believe I am done. So here are the, the amazing people that I worked with during my, my postdoc uh, mostly and in my time at Columbia University. Eventually, I will have a slide with my lab and, and the, the great people that I, uh, and the funding, but this is, a, this is a, because I focus mostly on, on the, the past work, I, I thought it would be very important to acknowledge all these amazing people that I, that I worked with. And so thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I welcome questions. I know I went very fast. I was speaking very fast. So I'm, I, I apologize if uh, it wasn't, uh, I, I, if I went too fast then. But I, you know, you can always email me and ask questions and I'm happy to discuss further. Great, Manal, thank you so much. That was such a fascinating journey through your <laughs> whole research trajectory and all the different tools and techniques and that you've done and, and really amazing results. I have tons of questions myself, but I will open it up to the audience being a good host. See if anyone has a question, you can ask it in the chat or unmute yourself. Maybe you could stop, okay, perfect. So I could see who's, uh, if someone has a question. And maybe while people are thinking, I'll ask the first question. Um, one of the many that I have here, was there your study on the sucrose? I was really interested in that. Is there is there a dose effect of the sucrose? I know with the mice studies, you had one group that had the sucrose and one that had nothing. Um, do you know if you give more sugar, is there more sort of damage to the brain or is there sort of a plateau with a certain amount? Well, um, the, the, um, the dose that we used was based on the recommendations that, um, that for clinically. Uh, so we did not like uh, change the dose. We just used one dose, but it was adjusted to the weight daily. So every, every day we weighed the, the pup. And so we would give an amount per, per weight. But, um, and this was something that we wanted uh, to, to do, like to give less or to give more. But um, and these studies take so long <laughs> that uh, we kind of run out of time. And now there are still so many questions using this dose that I, I cannot do that right now. But it, it is a very important point. And also, um, because there's this concern about this exposure to sucrose in babies, now they really went down on the dose um, and clinically to the most because some, some studies now are like looking at a dose effect and, and they reduce the dose to, to even less now in, in babies. But no, we didn't look at the dose. Thanks. Uh, Go ahead, that, Lisa. Yeah, I can maybe make an additional comment to that. Great presentation. Thanks, Manon. Um, we know that in adult rodents that, the, that what actually matters is not the volume, but the concentration. And uh, we were dosing it at 24, what was equivalent to 24% sucrose, but you actually get brain changes in rodents with only 15%. So the proportion uh, that we're dosing babies is actually higher than what you would find on a minimal effective dose with um, animals. And that's of course quite concerning given the volume of sugar exposure that the babies would experience in the nursery. Thank you. Joanna, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the fascinating um, work and sharing it with us. Um, I was going to ask the question about sort of the reaction to the, the sucrose and what, what are they doing in the community now? So that's, that's been asked. The other thing I was wondering about was um, what's it like? I mean, I know Lisa's talked a little bit about this in the past, but gaining access from a human participant standpoint, an ethics standpoint, to the NICU to do studies like this. I can imagine that it's always challenging to do uh, studies um, involving infants, let alone you know infants of 24 weeks. Um, for somebody who comes very far from your area, I would love to just hear, like, do you interact with the parents or how does, just how does that work? 
Well, I think that one of the important things is buy-in from the staff, from even now, you know, you involve these parents, these advisors, when you, when you start um, kind of thinking of your research even. And so having, having buy-in from, especially from the staff is very important and being very much aware of what we are dealing with. You know, this is a very sensitive time. These parents are very, very stressed. This is an unusual event. This was not what they were planning. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so you always have to keep this in mind. And so the staff that are on the team always have to keep this in mind. And also we, we often, and this is the case uh, now currently with Lisa, and that's how she's always functioned with the calmer is that the people that are actually doing the research in, in the NICU are uh, people that have experience with uh, the NICU. So a research nurse is always very important because otherwise you cannot handle the babies because these are baby, these babies are very, very fragile and you need to be aware of everything. And so have, you absolutely need a, a nurse to, to uh, conduct the research at the bedside. And maybe Elisa can can add on to. Yeah, um, it's a great question, Joanne. I think the two other things I would say is that uh, we use an NICU research nurse to consent. So Manon and I would not be consenting families because we're the, you know, there's bias around that. So um, it's someone who can review a medical chart or can go to the nurse who's looking after the baby and say, hey, how are these parents doing? So there's a lot of pre-screening that goes on before anyone would even go up to a family to ask for consent. And the nurse doesn't have to tell our research nurse what the issues are. They can just say, this is not an appropriate family to approach. No questions asked, we will not do it. So uh, there's a lot of gatekeeping that goes on before we actually go and speak with, with families. And I must say that I play my card as a nurse also when I say, okay, I, I used to work there. I know uh, how it is. And, and so that, that always helps also to have clinicians part of the team uh, uh, for, for, for these types of, of studies. Thank you. Great, thank you both. We have time for maybe one quick question. If anyone wants to unmute or put in the chat. If not, I can ask another question. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see anyone raising their hand. <laughs> I was curious about your relation, the relationship you found uh, with increasing pain that there was a thinner cortex um, in the infant study. And I just wondered if, do these kids catch up? Have you looked at it longitudinally or has anyone, or is this how, you know, what, what are the changes with time? Well, um, in, in, pre, in preterm children, in general, um, they show long-term, even past seven years, they've been followed as in, up to adulthood, um, not from this group, uh, with, from, from um, Roots group, but, um, um, and they, they still show brain alterations. But in relation to pain, that has not, to my knowledge, that has not been studied. Root studies these children up until seven, eight years. Great. All right, Manon, thank you very much from the DFP. It was a great talk. And I'm sure that you'd be happy to have questions and people can email you uh, later on. So thank you all. Yes, thank you everybody for attending. And